Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Today we celebrate Richard Modi Ano and his new book, The Forbidden Lunchbox, Punk Hostage Press, and S.A. Griffin with his new book, Soul Pandemic Music, Punk Hostage Press, two wonderful poets, two outstanding books published by a groundbreaking press. From 2010 to 2019, Richard Modiano served as executive director of Beyond Broke, where he produced and curated hundreds of literary events. The Huffington Post named him as one of 200 people doing the most to promote poetry in the United States. In 2022, the Los Angeles Long Beach Harbor Labor Coalition awarded Modiano the Joe Hill Prize for Labor Poetry. Richard's new book, The Forbidden Lunchbox, is exalting. Love and brotherhood, communitas, are themes in this book. In Richard Modiano's poem, On the Streets of the Lower East Side, he writes what could be his poetics. Quote, fearless knowledge of our capacity to hurt of our potential to love, of our creative generosity, end of quote. Richard has been generous, gracious in his poetry, work, spirit. His poetry is lyrical, clear-eyed, contains violent breakage at times. It's poignant, loving, elegiac, and compassionate. A superlative poet, Richard Modiano. Well, <clears throat> thank you for the kind words, Harry. I, I hope I live up to them. I'm going to start with something contemporary. This is not in the book, but it's something that's on our minds now. We are living through the nightmare edition of great men make history. In a world where a thousand gilded oligarchs, billionaire sheiks, and silicon deities rule, rule human future, Greed breeds reptilian minds. These strange days, as thermobaric bombs melt shopping centers and fires rage in nuclear reactors, our supermen can't validate their power in any plausible narrative of the future. The new czar of all the Russians surrounds himself with as much astrology, mysticism, and perversion as the terminal Romanovs. He believes that he must save the Ukrainians from being Ukrainian, lest the celestial destiny of the Rus becomes impossible. The present must be smashed in order to make an imaginary past the future. At the subway station, a young man approaching and a woman turning her back on him without a word and going out to the sidewalk. A man in a sudden outburst of anger and a woman who appears to have come late for their date. A group of girl students, each hand in hand with a friend, their free hands separately hailing a taxi. A plump middle-aged woman approaching with rapid mincing steps, every face looking intently on, on some immediate intimate aim. What I noticed coming from the deathbed of my brother. Almost every member of my extended family, grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, were wage laborers in the old country and the new world. They mined coal, hauled steel, labored on construction sites, and as office secretaries served the wealthy and worked as domestics. Um, they clerked in company stores. They cleaned offices and homes, stores, uh, took in laundry, even danced topless in Vegas floor shows. I joined the workforce at 15 and I've been at it ever since. I've worked as a dishwasher, fry cook, telemarketer, movie extra, babysitter, movie, movie projectionist, serigrapher, artist model, landscape hand, proofreader, ESL teacher, program manager, magazine editor, executive director of a venerable arts nonprofit. And now in old age, I'm washing dishes again. <laughs> My mother was a showgirl. She danced topless at the Flamingo in Vegas before I was born, where my father saw her, and she always proudly said, 
Ben Siegel himself hired her, a nice Jewish girl who he treated with respect, such a handsome man and a gentleman too. But that shiksa ruined him. Don't fall for a gold digger, she told me, as though I had any gold, as if we were rich. Don't worry, Ma, even though all of my girlfriends were shiksas, as it happened, and two were women of color. Well, she didn't mind as long as they were clean and weren't gold diggers. Just be happy, she told me, the hardest command of all. He spent most of the war stateside as a link instructor, his rank tech sergeant, stationed at bases in the Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, a state he hated because during the previous decade, he'd been hitchhiking cross country looking for work and was arrested in Galveston for vagrancy with three, with three strikes already against him, a New Yorker, a Jew, and he spoke Spanish. He had a lifelong hatred for Southern law enforcement. So when he was promoted to second lieutenant and reassigned to Greenham Common, United States Army Air Force Base in England, he was glad to go. A free train ride to New York City, some time with the family before the troop carrier the North took him across the North Atlantic, by that time mostly cleared of U-boats. And then by September 1944, England still on rations, but he got big meals of eggs, kippers, bread, and real butter steak and potatoes, real coffee with real cream. He told me he liked the barman at the pub down the road. The guy always treated him to an extra round, so he bought him a carton of eggs, five pounds of coffee, and a pint of cream. He gave this to the old barkeep before he left on his first mission. He was the navigator, and the barman stopped calling him Yank and started calling him the navigator. He never told me about those missions, and all he told me about his service during the war was about the dusty boredom of the Southwest, the tiny cattle towns near the places he was stationed, and the friends he made among the Mexicans. New York Jew meant nothing to them. 24 missions and the war in Europe was over. He was busted back to tech sergeant for running a floating crap game. He never told me a combat story, except for the one about the gunner who was hit. My father was bent over the finder when he felt something warm and wet splash against him. It was blood. Blood choked, soaked his shirt, and afterward, it stank in there. That was what he took away from the war. Blood and stench, stench and blood. <clears throat> I was in Japan for the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima with a peace delegation. And these are some of the things that I saw there. The Forbidden Lunchbox. Displayed here in Hiroshima Peace Museum, but not allowed by the US Congress to be shown to the US public, 1995 Smithsonian Institute. Small rectangular metal lunchbox, charred food visible, said to be a mixture of rice, barley, and soybeans. The box looks remarkably clean, scoured by atomic fire a little battered, but otherwise once fitted with a new lid, usable. Belonged to Shigeru Oreman, first year student at second Hiroshima Prefectorial Junior High School. He was exposed to the bomb at his building demolition work site, 600 meters from the hypocenter. Every day with his classmates, he was mobilized to help with the demolition of buildings for fire lanes. On August 6th, as usual, Taking the lunch his mother had prepared, he left home early in the morning. After the A-bomb fell, his mother wandered through the ruins of Hiroshima looking for him. Early on the morning of August 9th, on the bank of the Honkawa River, she found Shigeru's body with this lunchbox held tight under his stomach. The lunch Shigeru never ate was charred black. By order of Congress, no victims allowed. Nozzle Nozzle, a girl bar in Hiroshima. A girl bar with red neon called Riddle. The young woman took a seat on the bar next on the bar stool next to me. Nihongo wa daijobo? she asked. Hey, daijobio. A blast of cool air chilled the sweat on my face and carried her scent. She smelled good, but I noticed the mama san beside behind the bar. Why did she name the place Riddle? The mama-san answers, it sounds exotic. 
and seems to pose a question about life. She was eight when the bomb killed her mother and sister. She still carries scars from the glass that slashed her body. Peace Plaza, Hiroshima, Japan, August 6, 2005. The time, 10 minutes past eight in the morning. In exactly five minutes, a bell will toll to mark the moment when the atomic bomb exploded here. 8.10 and it's already 90 degrees. Five minutes from now and 60 years ago, it was 10,000 degrees in Peace Plaza, ground zero, the, hyper, the hypocenter. And here I sit on a folding chair with 500 other people on this spot, 1,500 feet beneath the detonation point, looking at the empty rostrum. Past the dais, I can see the iconic A-bomb rack building left standing and the white cenotaph where scores of unknown bodies reduced to ashes lay. To the right sit the big shots, Koizumi, the prime minister, the government officials from Europe, Russia, even from the People's Republic of China and the Republic of Korea, victims of Japan's aggression. Where are the Americans sitting with the rank and file, all as peaceniks, Buddhists, Methodists, Quakers, no official acknowledgement from the U.S. government, maybe for the best. The bell is tolling, 8.15 a.m., the sun's exploding. And when I lived in New York City, uh, I knew a playwright actress named Zoe Tamerlis. Um, she later became well known for her role as Ms. 45. Uh, and if you've seen her in that, she has blonde hair, but when I knew her, she, her hair was dyed black. So, poem for Zoe Tamerlis. Cats leap across my heart when I see your full red lips, and the glassy water breaks with white sparks, scattering your words in all directions. Zoe, your crowned scalp with inky black hair, a halo of dawn over the urban river's skyline. Tonight, you see through my words, Zoe of twilight ruby, and I sleep through your breath. Zoe of black leather, I dream through your tattooed arms. Zoe of a desert where the hawks turn blue, and I walk in your palm of Mount Meru. Zoe of obsidian in the coup d'etat, and I'm lost in your solar breasts, the flares made fertile. Zoe in the night of honeysuckle, Zoe of crystal palace, Zoe of Mongolian steps covered with gold Krugerrands, Zoe of boots under a red brick tenement, where anarchists are plotting our liberation. Zoe of dolphin spume, Zoe of lava made helium, Zoe. And um, I've met several people in, in the poetry community and um, that have meant something to me. So a word, poem for Iris Berry. You have to select a word. It will be talked about as little as possible and have a deep suggestiveness like nature, bloom within itself. And at the edge of the fate encircling you, it will become darkly and sweetly ripened. Of a hundred experiences, it always will be the sum total of only one. One teardrop becomes the harvest of all teardrops. A single point of red neon on Hollywood Boulevard on a dark evening is the light of the whole world. After that, your poem, like a substance entirely fresh, released far away from your memory, the same as a cord plucked from a stratocaster, the same as haze over the San Fernando Valley in spring, will suddenly begin to sing from its own recollection. On the streets of the Lower East Side, poem for Puma Pearl. Sing in me news and through me tell the story. On the streets of the Lower East Side, fearless knowledge appeared like a natural angel at the bottom of her heart. On the streets of the Lower East Side, fearless knowledge sought her with searchlights shining to the bottom of her heart. On the streets of the Lower East Side, fearless knowledge of the night and what it does to you filled her soul with stunning brilliance. On the streets of the Lower East Side, fearless knowledge exhaled in her words with the force of a truth gale that blew us away. Fearless knowledge, her life raft for, the, for that January grief. Fearless knowledge brought from insomnia, turned into art. Fearless knowledge of our capacity to hurt, of our potential to love, of our creative generosity. Fearless knowledge, Puma's knowledge, 
shared with us our knowledge, fearless knowledge. Poem for Dennis Cruz, inspired by his terrific punk hostage press book, The Beast is We. I saw a black tarantula crawling out from under the flower pots. Have you ever seen one? They are not spiders. They are black and furry and beautiful because when ugliness and wickedness are as deep as existence, when they come down from eternity, they have a perfection of their own. I watched this beast and I said to myself, how beautiful you can be with your long strangler's paws, your fine corset of dusky velvet, your furry belly, your fabulous jaws. It was when a big drop of poison fell. That's how you were born. And you live because you are perfect. But I'm going to take my revenge on you, filthy insect. I have no too many victims, and I have a debt to pay. And just imagine, the tarantula understood me. He was paralyzed, befuddled by his destiny. He looked around stupidly for a way out. But for him, there was no way out. My eyes hypnotized him. I was so sure he wouldn't go away that I went into the kitchen for the hammer. It gave me great pleasure to swing that hammer on the black beast, and I laughed as though I'd had one drink too many. I crushed the velvet tarantula with one blow. Crack! That's what you've got to do from time to time in this world, or the air would be unbreathable. And... I have, I'd like to, to sort of wrap it up with After the Cataclysm uh, for S.A. Griffin. And S.A. and I have had many conversations uh, in person through email about the state of the world, the state of poetry, the state of the arts, and, you know, what is, what's going to happen next. And, you know, this, these were our conversations during the pandemic, during lockdown, and we didn't know how it was all going to turn out. After the Cataclysm for S.A. Griffin. Truth will get communicated via old means and not new media. It will be shared by word of mouth and on paper, not online. Current social media is saturated. There is too much of it. Too much of it peddling lies and fear and loathing. Too much commercial media play. Too many channels that offer people too little choice. A new underground truth will have to emerge like it once did, from smart people living off very little, living in ruined and cheap neighborhoods, communicating via old experimental media. And there will be cafes and hangouts where kindred spirits and fellow travelers can commune with, another, with one another, bump into one another, talk and argue with, another, with one another, share, share, share sounds together, maybe play some old jazz riffs. They can be present in person and engage in old debates, old debates about the future and have direct human tr encounters. New repertory theaters will emerge, reenacting old plays by Beckett or Brecht or by new living theater troops, putting fresh spins on old staples, reinventing a new vanguard, inspiring new audiences while re-energizing old ones who have not entirely forgotten what it was like the first time around. What would begin again is a new poetry underground, with a new critical culture to be incubated, a will to live differently like it did before, making our cities interesting and democratic again. Or perhaps it will not happen. Perhaps nothing like this will ever happen again. Perhaps it is no longer possible for poetry to go on, having lost so much. Try again with the old answers, fail again, fail better. And even if poetry cannot go on, it will go on maybe for another 5,000 years. Thanks, Harry, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you for that fabulous reading, Richard. You know, that last poem reminded me of a couple of Beckett lines. You said, I, I can't go on, I must go on. So as long as that life force goes on. And I love your poems, your love poems to Zoe, to, you know, on the streets of the Lower East Side, Puma Pearl, the poem to Dennis Cruz, the poem to S.A., you always have a, a, an Iris Berry also. You always have a tremendous capacity for um, communitas, if you will, you know, sharing and helping your fellow poet, in this case, among other people. I know you're always for the working class, but, um, and also your vitality, 
And also the poems that I liked were the, the first poem about greed and then the poem about, you know, the dropping the bomb, you know, the forbidden lunchbox and the following poem. So you've, you've written a lot of great poetry. You know, I know you were at Beyond Broke for many years and what, you retired, uh, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, so when you were at Beyond Broke, and it was almost like a nightclub. I mean, you were there all the time setting up readings, hosting readings, et cetera. Did you write much poetry while you were, you know, the director at Beyond Broke? Or did you write more poetry after you uh, quit being the, the director there? Well, I I always carry a little notebook that, with me. I should have produced it uh, to show you, but I always carry this little pocket notebook which is a long tradition. I think it was probably inspired by seeing a photo of Jack Kerouac with a note, notebook in his breast pocket. And so between, between things happening at the Arm Baroque, I wrote down, a f I, got, I had enough time to write down a few ideas, but it wasn't until later that I was able to develop them into poems. And, and some of these poems about the people, the poets that, that uh, I read earlier, uh, came from when I was seeing them beyond Baroque or talking to them afterward or just knowing them. Uh, and S.A. I, I, is the guy that I know best. And, um, you know, we talk a lot. And, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. So they sort of, I, I'd say probably I've been able to write more since leaving Beyond Baroque, yeah. And I know you got involved in the poetry community in New York City at the Poetry Project mm -hmm. at St. Mark's Church many years ago where you met Ginsburg, Corso, and mm -hmm. Waldman, among others, Ted Berrigan. Yeah. What do you think about the state of poetry then compared to today in terms of uh, what, what is written in poetry just generally? And also uh, another question involved in that, what should we be talking about when we talk about poetry in our time? Well, um, the, you know, poetry, Poetry has sort of waxed and waned uh, over the years, over the decades, and, and that was in the 1970s, and that's now like almost 50 years ago. So, you know, over the past 50 years, um, there have been highs and lows, and at least here, here in the United States, uh, from 2016, uh, after that and, and over the past, and, and the period of the pandemic, uh, there was a lot of uh, confusion, let's put it that way, and uncertainty and isolation uh, and, and also a fear of speaking out so that uh, in some sense, uh, poetry sort of became quiet or at least some poets muted themselves, so to speak. Others continued to write and share their poems with other people, uh, other poets. Uh, and then I think now more recently, uh, people are coming back and they're speaking up again. So uh, I think that that poetry, you know, when I said poetry may not go on, that was a communication that that, that was something that Essie and I were talking about, like, what is what is going to happen? Because at that point, this was during the worst of the Trump period. And uh, and it looked like we were going to face uh, unconscionable censorship. Um, there were all kinds of the, these MAGA people who were out there to silence you, and they're still out there. They're still there. Some of them, you know, are have political positions, like we saw what recently happened in Florida, where they're censoring uh, history, really. Uh, so, you know, that 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 is a challenge, and I think I think poets now have a chance to step up and answer that. And I think that, you know, of course, we're always going to write about what moves us, something that is in our personal lives, about our family, our friends, our loved ones, our spouses, our significant others. I mean, because that's part of human life, you know, any way you look at it. But at the same time, I think that we're going to have to, as poets, we're going to have to address these larger issues. Um, because, you know, what was it? Shelley said, poets are the legislators of the race, something like that. So, you know, we have to reclaim that and, and start writing the laws again. <laughs> you know, looking back at Beyond Broke, you're one of my people, you're one of the people at Beyond Broke who, who was in my pantheon, you know, along with George Drury Smith and 
Alexander Garrett, you know, Joe Hansen, John Harris, Jim Crusoe, and a few others. When you look back at the 10 years, I know you still go there, but I mean, when you look back at the 10 years, I believe it was maybe longer that you were at Beyond Broke, what, uh, what could you say about Beyond Broke in terms of your, your journey there? Well, um, when I came in, I, I was, I, I sort of co-curated some readings there before I was on the board of trustees before I became director. And when I became uh, director there, I was, I was sort of, there was a, a period of, <clears throat> excuse me, of confusion, uh, disarray and uncertainty. And I sort of was functioning as de facto director. I wasn't officially the director. I just happened to be the board member who lived closest to beyond Baroque at that time. So you know, I rode my bicycle there and I talked to the staff. I said, what, what, what do we need to do here? And you know, they basically told me. And um, yeah, you know, I talked to each person there. I said, what's, what's, what, what need, what do we need to fix, and so on. And and that's sort of how um, I became director was, you know, talking to them. And then they they elected me as director. They wrote a letter to the board and said, you should have Richard be the director now. So. Um, in the initial years, I wanted to repair the reputation of Beyond Baroque and change the vibe, so to speak, make it welcoming again, uh, tune down the anger and the distrust, sweep it away. Eventually, I think I was able to do that and, um, and open it up uh, to all kinds of people. I mean, my, my particular uh, bias, if you will, is a sort of an egalitarian one, and I wanted everybody to have a chance, whether they were whether they were known or unknown, whether they were starting out or fully mature and accomplished, um, I wanted to give those people a chance. And um, you know, some of them, some of them, you know, I was taking a chance too on some of them, and they didn't really uh, produce. Let's put it that way. They tried, they had their shot, and um, you know, they moved on to something else, maybe. But you know, I thought it was worthwhile to to take some risks and see uh, what might happen. So, well, you did a fabulous job there, and we have two minutes, uh, actually one minute left. But I would just like to ask you this one question, and uh, you could give me a brief answer. I know it's a complicated one, but when when did you get involved in uh, your your empathy and your compassion and your work for the working class of the world? Well, I guess it was back um, probably when I was, uh, you know, I just just growing up. You know, my my family were second generation Americans. Their their parents came from the old world. Uh, they were not English proficient. Um, they were they were very intelligent people. They spoke multiple languages, but. Uh, the only jobs available to immigrants back in those days, and I'm talking about uh, in the early 20th century, uh, were low-paying jobs, and uh, there were there were no opportunity there was no opportunity of conditions for them. And my parents benefited from policies like the New Deal. Uh, and my father's formal education ended at the seventh grade. My mother was a high school graduate. But thanks to uh, the New Deal, they had a level playing field and they were able to make something of themselves. You know, my father spoke four languages. Both of my parents were autodidacts. They were always reading and learning things. And they encouraged me and my brother to read and learn. And they didn't they never censored um, our reading. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, we could read whatever we want. And of course, we never chose to read anything like pornography, anything like that. But otherwise, uh, you know, we, we could read comic books, monster magazines, science fiction paperbacks, uh, difficult philosophical texts. Uh, you know, my father, you know, was my father was uh, really into Sephardic culture, Sephardic Jewish culture. Uh, and he spoke Ladino, which is Judeo Spanish. He also spoke standard Spanish. And he loved the music and the poetry of that culture. And he sort of transmitted that to me and my brother. But at the same time, uh, he always, and my mother too, 
emphasize that, you know, working people really are the backbone of the United States and they're the people that keep this country going. It's not the bosses. It's the people that are the people make money for the bosses. The bosses might get the credit, but we are the ones that make it happen. So that's pr pretty much where it came from. I always like what you what you say and what you stand for. You are certainly who you are within and without. And you've done a lot of great work for poetry and you've done you've written a lot of exemplary poetry so thank you very much richards it's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show thank you for the kind words harry my pleasure a working actor since 1978 s.a griffin lives loves and works in los angeles he is the co-editor of beat not beat and the outlaw bible of american poetry published by punk Hostage Press. His most recent book of poetry is Pandemic Soul Music with drawings by his late sister, Robin Lynn Griffin. In Pandemic Soul Music, I found empathy, a fight against injustice and brotherhood. Essay ends, Sangre River, quote, a never ending wound of love, end of quote. There's a marvelous beat in these poems. He ends, can't stop the beat, quote, a hummingbird that never leaves the heart. I love the simple practice of acting with its clarity and sagaciousness. The depth, hurt, and strength of what does not kill you and the courage to stand up against his abusive father is stunning. Essay's poetry is honest, vulnerable, astonishing. Essay Griffin. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, that was my stepfather. I don't want to give my father credit where credit is not due. My father, my father and my mother divorced when I was uh, five years old. So, uh, but my stepfather was a monster. He he deserves all the credit. <laughs> thank you for that. But thank you for those kind words, Harry. I really appreciate it. As you know, I have tremendous love and respect for you and your work. And your, I mean, uh, talk about somebody who uh, is. Um, giving himself to the community. I mean, as we were talking just before we got connected here on the Zoom, isn't this the 143rd program that you've done uh, yeah. there at Motion Picture Home and in what, two years? Three years. Three years. I mean, still, that's staggering. And everything that you've done before this point, I mean, I mean, um, early on, in my life as a poet here in Los Angeles, you were one of the very first people that was there and one of the very first people that really, you know, championed my work and, and supported me. And I really appreciate that because uh, not only do I have tremendous respect for you as a poet, but also as an actor. And that's, well, both struggles continue on. <laughs> as a people, I'm too old and stupid to do anything else. <laughs> My sister, uh, Robin, as um, I talk about in the intro to the book, um, was, um, her and her twin brother uh, were um, both misdiagnosed as mentally retarded when they were babies. And uh, as it was revealed later on, fundamentally, they're, they're both on the autism spectrum. My sister, mostly. And so over the years, what I did was I would send her money couple of bucks so that she could, you know, she wanted to buy comic books and coffee with it. And then I would get uh, drawings in return. And uh, it was a way to kind of confirm for her what she was doing as a creative person and to give her some, you know, uh, some worth and value as a creative person too, which we so rarely get. But um, anyway, I collected a couple of hundred of them and they're drawings like this one here. Let me see. Can I, there we go. Like this. And uh, let me see if I can find another one. And so I'm really, I'm really thrilled that I was able to uh, include her work in this book. There's another one there. So they're very uh, expressionist, very sort of uh, not really abstract. Abstract's not a good way to frame it, but just expressionist, uh, especially when you follow the line that she created. It was extremely expressionist, and it was her way of kind of exercising demons, and also kind of maybe in many instances. It was the way she wanted to remember her life, you know, as many of us do in our, in our creative existences. Anyway, um, this is on Punk Hostage Press, same as Richard. And Richard wrote the intro for this. 
And it's a beautiful introduction, Richard, which I really appreciate. But again, um, I'm in the company of two incredible people, and I'm so honored to be here. And to speak to the people at the Motion Picture Home, I mean, that's well, you guys, it's a beautiful place, and I'm so grateful that it's here. And maybe someday I will join you, <laughs> if I'm lucky. <laughs> so I'll read a few from the book here. And um, most of these poems were written uh, during the course of the pandemic. The pandemic not just being COVID, but the advent of Trumpism and Trump. And uh, the uh, the only way to frame it, the decline of our civilization and our culture, kind of civility. Uh, but inside all of that too, there are always there are always great people and human beings and humanity. And it's our job to basically not just reach for it, to embrace it. Our job is to embrace humanity. And uh, as the poem itself can never die, humanity can never die either, as we see all the time, especially in stories of war. We see these 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 stories within the context of war itself that are just so deeply human because uh, nothing can really stop that. Nothing can stop the human, human, human soul and spirit, as Richard and I would like to talk about with Frank Capra and even Harry. I mean, Frank Capra, basically, the, he embodied that in almost all of his work, the, the idea that humanity exists no matter what. The good Germans. The TV laughs at us. We are fat, stupid, and to the left. The believers are right, incapable of apology because there is no apologizing for them. The believers are my siblings, my in-laws, a few close friends. The believers are the gay neighbors, my stepmother, ex-wife's brother, and most all of his born-again family. They have unshakable faith in the sainted democracy of guns and sing the trickle-down honey of money. The believers believe that global warming is a conspiracy cooked up by the Chinese on capitalist crack. President Obama from Kenya on a hip hop prayer rug. Hillary Clinton from Benghazi wearing a slinky red email sex scandal sifted from the medicated tea of yesterday's news. A reality show for Christ starring Kellyanne Wrongway as misinformed along with a half dozen jittery sled dogs and Birkenstocks that can see Russia invading the White House from their disappearing backyard. Early on in this dark movie about World War II I saw late one night, a well-dressed, educated, middle-class family is sitting down to dinner. Just outside, tanks are coming down their street. As the father, nervously trying to comfort his anxious family, says, no need to worry. The soldiers won't be coming for us. We're the good Germans. There are no good Germans. There are only Germans in this movie. And we are all Germans here tonight. And I just celebrated my 69th birthday about a week ago. What, what day is today? 21st? Uh, five days ago. And this poem was written. The uh, pandemic was announced about a day before I turned 66. And uh, this poem was written on St. Patrick's Day, 2020. I believe in the love. It is all that we have, Scott Warnberg. It's here. The virus that eats old people. And yesterday, I hit 66. Never thought this old flesh could be so appealing. An uneasy contract for a body shy at heart. Atlas reaches back, an itch he just has to scratch. The sky falls. Icarus flies into the sun on nitro bat wings. Boom goes the dynamite. It's a whole new game of extraordinary innings. New boundaries are being drawn around a state of heightened emotions. Everyone in their right or left mind are emergency clowns painted in primary colors of angry, afraid, and sad. The elevator to fight or flight that has no stop button moves swiftly as this swirling miasma of feelings shifts into electric sleep on a new set of wheels. Big moments get small in less than a New York minute. A single week seems like years waiting for your ticket to ride. We all hang suspended in our collective disbelief. But there is still kind 
this in the world, compassion, civility, there is love. Get it while you can, but on an empty shelf somewhere in your heart. Remember where you put it in case of emergency. Don't be afraid to break the glass. Here and there, together and alone, we have never been where we are going, although it is guaranteed we will get there. Time abides. The earth abides. People, too. So the blushing heart that rises with the sun every day, laughing in the clover. This poem um, I wrote in response to a podcast I was listening to. Um, when did I write this? I don't know, about a year or two ago. Uh, an amazing play, um, I, and and it was based on uh, the experiences of a photojournalist, I believe, from Time Magazine, who fundamentally did the William Conrad thing, not William Conrad, but the Joseph Conrad thing of going up river and photographing and documenting everything. And um, and so this uh, tribal filmmaker from the Amazonian rainforest was speaking. And um, what he talked about was his experience of the world and how the, he was connected and the tribe was connected. And what he said was this, which blew my mind, that when the tribe looked out upon the world, they considered the world whiteness, that everything was infected by whiteness. Um, and it didn't matter what race you were or what culture you belonged in. The whole world had been affected by whiteness. And that's what inspired this poem. Sangre River, for Bibiana Pedia Maltos. The world is a river, a dance. The thin blue sky dances above the river. And together, the sky and the river are another dance. Time is the song beating in our hearts as we build bridges to the stars. Can we hear ourselves? Can we hear one another? Our body hears the wind in the trees, the flight of time that speaks to us all in our bones. The whiteness that inhabits progress is the madness imprisoned in our stories that destroys nature, that writes and rewrites the deep river we inhabit. Question the narrative sickened by the virus of progress. Escape the affliction inside that destroys our dance. Our world weeps. Can you hear the edges of our world? crying out to us? Listen to the voices from the ends of our world where the common struggle can be found, a never-ending wound of love. And this poem is for our great friend and brother, Scott Wanberg, who passed away, oh man, in 2011. It's amazing how quickly time collapses. You know, we're, that's it, man. And this is also an epigram from a Scott in the beginning. Friendship is Stronger Than Math by Scott Wamberg. That was his, uh, his quote. Friendship Stronger Than Math. Scott and I had just left Al's bar off third in traction downtown after a long night of frantic dancing and cheap beer, celebrating Scott's second book, The Elect Yes Indeed, which was about to hit the shelves. Both of us lit like Christmas. Ever been the... Been to the Pacific dining car? No. Well, then we must go. As your publisher, it is my job to treat you to the best steak in L.A. Scott's eyes open wide with double-barreled delight. Yes, he fires off, hanging out the window of my 59 caddy like a big shaggy dog. Red meat! Red meat and wine, I roar, crushing the accelerator and cranking the wheels, redirecting my fish-faced car toward the edge of town. It was well past midnight as we stood before the maitre d', the two of us soaked to the bone, our old denims and dingy teas steaming with sweat. The maitre d', the maitre d' looks up. May I help you? This man is a great poet. My arm draped around Scott. He was a champion heavyweight, and he needs a great steak. Right this way, replies the maitre d', as he smiles politely and turns to lead us to our booth. Scott's broad electric smile as big as his appetite. Once an old railroad car, King Man's Diner, the dining car had evolved into a high class eatery where you could find the hoi polloi mixing it up with the gentry, well into the wee small sonars of any given night. Blue collar, white collar, hookers and hustlers, shooting stars, bureaucrats and rebels, poets and writers. Whatever you want, Scott, it's on me. 
Those were Cadillac days, typewriter days wrapped in worn ribbon and gestating cyber culture. Hillbilly, hillbilly rich long distance days of phone booze and cartoon supermen. Nights of words without end, of big red meat and dark red wine. And as Scott would say, arm draped around my shoulder, friendship is stronger than math. Scott was what we considered the genius of our crowd. He really was. He was an amazing person and lucky we were to know him and to call him brother and friend. Thanks. I give thanks for love in the world, however it, been, however it may find you or me or every lonely heart in any given lost and forgotten corner. I give thanks for the kindness that continues to light tired eyes old eyes and young that have seen too much. I give thanks for your laughter that can lift a weary brow, healing every sadness. I give thanks for peace, for the seed of hope that moves mountains, and for all those foolish enough to believe, for their faith will carry us home. And I give thanks for your voice, the destructible song of yourself that breathes life into the dark night of the soul and loves out loud, rising above the maddening din of the sometimes deafening crowd for friends and family, for our blue mother earth, for magic and mystery. And this I wrote at the advent of Brett Kavanaugh. We have lost the Supreme Court. We have lost the, judici the judicial branch of our government. And as Richard indicated earlier, and as we are spinning, it's time to save our democracy and to save ourselves. The grand old party. The star spangled banner is playing so loudly that nobody at the party can hear Lady Liberty's muffled screams coming from inside the Lincoln bedroom. Flat on her back, Liberty is doing all that she can to fend off an unsteady Trump daddy drunk with power. He has an executive hand over her mouth while his other fat fingers climb up her garments, desperately attempting to find their way past her port of entry and into her sunset gates. Come on, Liberty baby. Let me smack that sweet huddled ass of yours yearning to breathe free. You know that you want it. The Donald's aerodynamic pomp quacks and achieves liftoff, cutting manic shadows into the bedroom walls as he smashes a Trump thing into Liberty's weakening flesh. Uncle Sam is catching all the action, standing sentry behind home plate in front of the locked door, the old wizened white beard waving his hot dog wildly about, shouting, Uncle Sam wants you to play ball. Outside in the Rose Garden, Congress is making hay with a gerrymandered vote, holding hands kumbaya-like for the cameras, singing, Citizens United, and it feels so good. Emma Lazarus rises from the grave on the shoulders of uncountable millions upon of wounded women roaring me too across the crowded centuries. President Great again, dead to their declaration, continues ripping away at Lady Liberty's tattered gown. The ghost of Emma Lazarus breaks down the door of the Lincoln bedroom, shattering the supreme darkness as the colossus of angry women comes rushing in behind her. They will not be denied. It is the Donald's Waterloo. Not even Putin can save him. And uh, I'm going to read this one for the people of Ukraine and for my friend Bert de Vries over in the Netherlands. Glory to the heroes. Armed with an inspired lunacy, Putin is his own god. A nightmare for the modern era. As his terror campaign moves forward, the cult of war grows inside sovereign borders where all thoughts have been tried and found guilty. The carriers of plague with looks that kill have landed with their tortured reward, lost lives on parade collapse in despair as the people greet their makers of fear. Ritualized by the underwriters of conflict, the authorities of speech broadcast the intercepted letters of family and friends. History bends before the orthodoxy of bombs, flowers of evil executing a catechism of calculated risk, risk blossom with a bright and terrible lust, a global light of muted lifetimes baked into the sacred tapestry of night. 
all the quiet stars falling like iron dice, tumbling into trapdoors of agony and tears ever after. And then, uh, since we're running short on time, I will read uh, this one I wrote for uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky after seeing his film, Endless Poetry. Endless Poetry. Success and failure ride the same rail, visit the same small towns and big cities full of rise and fall, heated with genius and despair, full of practice, endless practice, banging away, eager trigger finger of love, itching at existence. Life and love ride the same small rail, whole and wholly brilliant, waiting for breaks beneath the same yellow sun, the big breaks, the small. But there are no big or little breaks, just breaks full of failure and success, rise and fall, irrepressible blossoms of genius and despair. And after having spent whatever it is you've got riding the rails, your mirrors shattered by choices, all looking back at you, there you shall rest, endlessly broken, where life answers life, and love is a butterfly. Well, thank you, S.A., for that marvelous reading. I love the, what you said about your sister, and also you always deal with the present world. You know, there's an ethical integrity in your writing. Thank and you. you. You as well as Richard, each one of you is uh, conscious of what's going on in the world. You're not solipsistic in that regard. So I appreciate your your consciousness on that right there. Have you always been, uh, you know, that conscious about the politics and all that? I know you've always been very caring for your human, your human uh, brother, sister, and your your fellow poet. Have you always been that conscious? Or did that come about at a particular time in your life, you know, caring for what's going on in the world, not just burying yourself in your own emotions? Well, I mean, I grew up at the just of five, and uh, my my uh, parents were fairly absent, my stepfather and my mother, during the course of our, our term as children. And I grew up uh, also in the Project Rich in California. So I grew up um, taking care of people. You know, I kind of was a de facto parent in many ways. So I think it comes from that. And also my grandmother, my grandmother, Elsie, who kind of loved me into being, she was an amazing person who took care of people and took care of me. Um, so that being said, um, I was fairly unconscious of most of the world. I was very conscious of the, the immediate world, the place where I grew up and my family and taking care of them and such. But uh, I didn't know much about the big, great big world outside, and and so in an effort to escape uh, my domestic scene, which would would have killed me, and I was really literally uh, fantasizing about how to kill my stepfather, I joined the military, I joined the Air Force during the Vietnam era, and um, that's where I became aware of the world immediately. By the time I was out of basic training, I was a changed individual, not just because I was, uh, you know, in, in the military, but uh, I immediately became aware of the world and. I immediately didn't agree with Vietnam anymore, and I had four years to go, so I had to struggle through it. And it was a struggle. It was tough, but uh, um, that really transformed me, and I became uh, very political at that point, which is one of the reasons uh, I didn't get along with the military so well. In fact, my boss in Georgia, working in the base hotel, at one point called me a communist, and I was kind of flattered by that. <laughs> But um, I don't, I, I mean, you know, the poem is, uh, the poem is um, uh, ubiquitous. The poem is, as I just wrote to somebody, it's a fact of love, you know, and um, you can't stop giving because you can't stop receiving. And it's important to me that, that we all, uh, when Richard, when we, uh, he was there when at my book party uh, on the 12th, Kerouac's birthday, 101st birthday, and Richard and I have certainly been on that path. I know you have to Perry beat path, which is em, embodies a lot of this. But, but, um, but you know, hell, I lost my train of thought on down the track too fast as I always do. But, um, but no, it's it's oh yeah. But you know, poetry, the to be empathic to 
to be a part of the world. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Is I, I was begging people at the moment to uh, stand up, to stand together. That we, poems and poets and poetry don't necessarily have responsibility for this, but I feel it's my responsibility to the poem and to my life because poetry brings me here. Poetry saves me. It saved me. You know, Invictus by William Ernest Henley at age 13, my life. You know, uh, I've heard it covers me black as the pit from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. And boy, I'll tell you, that changed my life too. And so I, I kind of, you know, in the, uh, I guess in the Zen way, I owe my life to poetry now because lower poetry saved my life, you know. Um, and um, I'm glad and grateful for that because, man, um, it's a, it's a just a beautiful thing. And to know people like you, I wouldn't know you guys, you know. And uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be married to my wife. I have a poem in the book about Furley, Lawrence Furley and Getty is dead. Long love live Lawrence Furley and Getty. And if Ginsburg hadn't read How, and if uh, Lawrence Furley and Getty hadn't published How, and if the feds hadn't bro uh, broke broke down walls and tried to steal everything and shut us down, and the poem won as process in the courts of, I wouldn't be here, man. I wouldn't be talking to you guys. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be married to my wife. So hello, poem and process. It's it's everything, man. You know, we have a few minutes left. I would like you just to take a minute, if you could, if you would, and uh, just tell us a, a little bit more about an event that you created, initiated, and did several years ago, the Poetry Bomb. Yeah, the Poetry Bomb. <laughs> yeah, which is named for my grandma, Elsie. She's my own personal saint and angel. And uh, the Poetry Bomb, I had this itch, man, to scratch, and I had to scratch it, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. All I knew was I had to find a bomb and fill it full of poetry. That's all I knew. And it was weird. And so I looked for years for the bomb, couldn't find it. And then um, intuitively, it happens to me so often, uh, you know, thought, best thought, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it came to me that I needed to go on Craigslist and look for a bomb. And I couldn't find one. Man. I looked for years. It was midnight. I clicked. The first hit came up was a bomb. I bought it. Hundred bucks, a little over. Uh, uh, it was a Vietnam era practice bomb, Navy bomb. And the guy who I bought it from told me, he said, You were the very, he said, I had just literally put that up and you were the first hit and I got it. So, anyway, I know I'm running out of time, but the poetry bomb, the experience of the poetry bomb, it's got poems from people from all over the world by de facto agreeing to disagree. And I traveled all over the country. And what I told people, I read poems from inside the bomb and then I would say, I say war, the art, artifice, artifact of war, we're created to enforce agreements. If we don't learn to disagree right now, we're screwed. We must learn to disagree. All civility, all human discourse, all life depends upon our ability to just disagree with one another. Naturally, we disagree with one another all the time. As, as our cells, as atoms, as they, they collide and they make agreements for us and we make agreements on, on top of that. We must learn to Agree. Our Congress is out of control. Our culture is out of control. We are on the verge of civil war. And I really believe that we must save ourselves and poetry can save us. Well, thank you, S.A. You gave thank us, you. As, as Richard did too, an, uh, an exhilarating, poignant, uplifting reading. And you're both facing important things that are happening in the world and you're not shying away from them. You're embracing them. So we appreciate your candor and your excellence in putting all you know from your mind and heart into the poem and you are equally the poems that you write and so i'm always i'm always thankful for that so thank you sa griffin and richard modiano for your magnificent readings and here's jennifer Clymer. what an hour thank you thank you all um and I could not agree more that we all need to be able to hear each other and disagree and um, still be a unified country. It's crazy. Um, this was lovely. I hope that we see you all back here. But of course, I have to ask, Carrie, what's up next week? Next Tuesday, four wonderful actors, Corinne Conley, Helen Richmond, Kay Wiseman, Tony Sawyer, will read from Ada Limon's The Hurting Kind. She is the first 
Latina to be the Port Laureate. She's the present Port Laureate of the United States. And her book, as I said, is The Hurting Kind, which is a meditation on love and death and lineage. She's, she's from California, Sonoma. So um, thank you both and thank you, Jennifer. My thank you, Harry. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you thank guys you. so much.